I'd like to call this meeting of the Health, Finance, and Policy Committee on February 23rd to order. Chair Liebling is presiding, uh, presenting a bill in, a, in the Commerce Committee this afternoon, so it will, I will be chairing the first part of the meeting. Um, today we will have presentations from DHS on a bill from Representative Richardson. Our first item of business is to uh, have the clerk take the roll. Krista, can you please take the roll? Yes. Chair Liebling, excused. Representative Hewitt. Present. Present. Um, Representative Schumacher, excused. Representative Ackland. Present. Representative Backer. Present. Representative Bonner. Present. Representative Bierman. Representative Bierman. Representative Bolden. Present. Representative Damoth. Present. Representative Freiberg. Present. Representative Grunhagen. Representative Grunhagen. Representative Keel. Representative Keel. Yeah, Representative Grunhagen's here. Okay, Greenhagen present. Representative Morrison. Morrison present. Representative Munson. Munson present. Representative Pryor. Present. Representative Quam. Representative Quam. Representative Breyer. Present. Representative Schultz. Present. Representative Wolgamot. Wolgamot, present. A quorum is present. Quorum is present. Today, uh, I'm sorry, got to get my right space here. Um, we need to approve the minutes of the uh, February 22nd meeting. Um, Representative Ryer, have you read the minutes? Yes, I have. I move that they are adopted. I ask uh, approval of the minutes for February 22nd. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Next, William, we will move on. Uh, sorry, I already did that. <laughs> um, our first presentation will be a presentation from DHS on their proposal in the governor's budget of making changes to the non-emergency transportation system in Minnesota. Assistant Commissioner Matt Anderson will be presenting for DHS. Mr. Anderson. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? We can, Mr. Anderson. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, committee members. Happy to be here to uh, talk with you today about our non-emergency medical transportation benefit and some uh, changes that are included in the governor's proposed budget. Uh, next slide. Uh, just for uh, some context setting, uh, non-emergency medical transportation covers uh, transportation for our enrollees to any medically necessary service using the most appropriate and least costly mode of transportation. So this is a benefit that's covered both in our medical assistance or Medicaid population it also covers individuals who are under 19 years of age in our Minnesota care population. Next slide. When we talk about non-emergency medical transportation, we're really talking about a broad range of different types of transportation. Our clients are offered the least costly but most appropriate mode of transportation for their needs. We start with mode one uh, and through an assessment based on the physical and cognitive abilities of the enrollee, we assess whether they have access to a personal vehicle or public transportation and move up in the options until appropriate transportation is found to meet their needs. Now, some of the less obvious uh, types of transportation that we have here, uh, unassisted is referring to really what we would consider to be sort of a taxi cab uh, kind of experience where a vehicle picks up a person at their home, uh, the, the car waits out at the curb, the person goes to the car, it drops them off at their appointment. Uh, this also includes public transportation. 
assisted transportation provides assistance for individuals either because of their cognitive or uh, physical limitations where the driver or uh, uh, the provider would go to the door of the home, help that person get into the vehicle. And then when they get to their uh, medical appointment, help the person out of the vehicle and into the facility to make sure that they get to uh, where they need to be for their appointment. Um, protected transportation is our newest mode of transportation. It's also our least used uh, mode of transportation. It's really designed to help transport individuals who are experiencing a mental health crisis and it's a way as an alternative uh, to having them transported by law enforcement, which could actually exacerbate their crisis. And so it's trying to give a different uh, uh, means of transportation for those individuals. Next slide. These services are not exactly uh, part of the non-emergency medical transportation benefit, but they're coordinated and, and administered jointly with it. Uh, these benefits are only allowed in certain situations. So, for example, someone has to be gone from home a certain number of hours uh, before they would be eligible to be reimbursed for meals. Uh, or lodging is only allowed if it's cost effective to pay for the lodging rather than the back and forth uh, trips. Uh, but because they are administered together, we wanted to, to note those for the committee's background. Next slide. Within our non-emergency transportation, we have uh, different ways that the program is administered. So today uh, for enrollees in managed care, uh, the managed care ed, uh, organizations administer that benefit uh, for their members. Uh, one exception to that is managed care organizations are prohibited from making payments directly to their enrollees. Uh, so for personal mileage reimbursement or meals reimbursement or parking reimbursement, all of those reimbursements that would go directly to the enrollee, those are administered by the county instead of the managed care plan. But otherwise, when you think of managed care and non-emergency medical transportation, that health plan is administering the benefit for its enrollees. In our fee-for-service programs, the administration of the program is split between counties and the state. So the counties administer modes one through four or those lower level uh, modes of transportation. Uh, the um, uh, counties uh, enroll and pay providers. Uh, they set the procedures for their members uh, in their counties to access those services. For the higher level modes of transportation, those are administered by the state. Uh, so the state enrolls and pays providers. We have a vendor that we contract with to do the uh, level of need assessments for enrollees for those services and manage it through that. Next slide. So the proposal in uh, Governor Walz's budget is to uh, create a uniform administer of, administrator of non-emergency medical transportation to really consolidate uh, the benefits under a single administrator uh, with a single point of contact for enrollees. So the uh, proposal would include both our medical assistance and Minnesota care enrollees. It would include both our fee-for-service and managed care populations and it could be administered on a statewide basis or a regional basis. The genesis for this proposal really began back in 2017. Uh, the Federal Office of Inspector General performed an audit of our non-emergency medical transportation services and found that 75% of the rides did not comply with either state or federal requirements, mostly due to one of three reasons. Either there was uh, a lack of sufficient documentation uh, about the ride and, and about the, the transport. There wasn't any documentation at all, uh, or the auditor was unable to find a medical service that the person received that would have justified uh, coverage for the ride. As a result of that audit, DHS returned $1.9 million to the federal government. A similar audit was performed by the Minnesota uh, Office of Inspector General uh, and found similar results. This audit showed, also showed that having a coordinator uh, administering the program increased the likelihood that the transport was provided appropriately. So this proposal that Governor Walz uh, put forward in his proposed budget would streamline the administration of the program on two fronts. First, it would allow for greater economies of scale by combining all of the non-emergency medical transportation under one administrator. And so you'd have more rides and, and uh, larger volumes. 
And second, we would be providing our enrollees in the current program who find it difficult to navigate between who they're supposed to call for what types of rides. Uh, we would be able to give them a single one call experience for any of their non-emergency medical transportation needs, whether they're in fee-for-service or managed care, whether the mode of transportation would otherwise have been administered by the county or the state. It would just be one call and the rides would be taken care of. Next slide. I also want to mention another aspect of uh, the governor's proposed budget, another proposal in there, and that is to allow for purchase of uh, bus passes, uh, monthly bus passes when they're, um, uh, when they're available for our enrollees. This proposal is really driven by the need to uh, figure out how we can use our Medicaid and Minnesota care programs to go further upstream to address social determinants of health that are driving uh, a lot of the health issues and quality of life for our enrollees. And we know that one of the most significant social determinants of health and serves as a barrier to accessing care as well as other life needs is transportation. And so what this proposal would do is take our current program, which does allow for people to get a monthly transportation pass, but only if the number of rides and the cost of rides that they will need for medical appointments would be at least or greater than the cost of the monthly bus pass. What this proposal would do would take away that cost effectiveness test and basically say, if you're an enrollee and you're gonna need transportation for one uh, service in a month, that, you'd be able, that uh, the program would be able to get a monthly pass, transportation pass for you. And I wanna clarify at the outset, this does not preclude anyone from receiving other modes of transportation based on their needs. Uh, so the other, all seven modes of transportation would still be available, would still be an assessment to determine what's most appropriate and least costly. Um, and it wouldn't require anyone who's not served by public transportation to use this mode of service. That wouldn't uh, uh, accomplish our, our objectives. Um, it also, uh, if someone is living in an area that doesn't have public transportation, obviously it wouldn't uh, apply to them as well. So this is a step to being able to say, not only would we be able to provide transportation to those medically necessary services, but by providing a monthly pass, we would also be providing transportation to jobs, childcare, the pharmacy, grocery stores, uh, what have you, all of which enhance the person's quality of life and ultimately their health. So with that, I will take questions uh, on either proposal if uh, the committee has questions. Um, and uh, Mr. Chair, turn it, turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, Representative Keel, do you have a question or are you signifying you are here? How about both? <laughs> would you mind if we hold questions till the second uh, presenter, please? That would be just fine. Um, and Representative Grunhagen, you're okay with that too? Yes, I'm fine. Thank you. Mr. Diogo Hans, Hans, I'm sorry if I messed your name up here. I, I know you as Mr. Reese most of the time, but um, if you wouldn't mind uh, pronouncing your name and giving us your title, please. Is he here? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Diogo Hayes. Yep, he's here. There he is. Sorry, apologies. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, I am here just to answer technical questions if needed. Uh, Mr. Anderson, uh, Mr. Anderson covered the presentation for us. All right, thank you, sir. So I guess we can move to questions. So uh, Representative Keel, you had your hand up first. We're going to go with you first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. Um, I have some real concerns about this program. I have, my understanding is, is that this has been tried three different times and um, DHS was actually um, supposed to implement a program uh, that has never been done. Now, I, this is before I was in, I think I was in the legislature, but not in health and human services. So I understand not quite as much about this. And this is something I learned just in the last hour. Um, but my concern when I look at um, the NM, uh, the non-emergency medical transportation. I live in Northwestern Minnesota. Um, my services provide for at least seven counties. Um, I also have a Tri-Valley Opportunity Council that does bus people that can go to an appointment 
um, scheduled that they don't need any help generally with this. But I'm very concerned financially, um, I, we're not gonna have that service. And I, I find it interesting with COVID uh, that we would even suggest that somebody ride together for a dialysis machine uh, ride. However, I know with um, uh, uh, um, immunizations and such that they probably will be in a better situation. But um, we're talking about, uh, the gentleman told me that because the doctors are overloaded that these rides that were an hour, maybe two, are now um, becoming five hours. Um, he's running out of staff. Uh, the costs of this program uh, that now exist, uh, we need to um, have a bill that funds these guys better. But we need these services. I don't know, my ambulance services are not gonna be able to provide all the stretcher transport because of the volunteers and the situation there. Um, I, I just, I just don't see um, the mode four and three, four and five can be provided by my NAMTs now. And I don't know who would be doing that. So um, is it commissioner, assistant commissioner Anderson, how, how would you suggest that would even happen in Northwestern Minnesota um, with the services that we have now? Thank you, uh, Representative Real, uh, Mr. Commissioner. I'm sorry, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, that's okay. I've been called a lot worse. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Keel, uh, essentially what we would anticipate is that the uh, under this proposal, uh, the administrator uh, or, or in the in the region of, of your state is going to contract with largely the same providers that are providing the services now and in areas where uh, those services are already limited and where the um, uh, available providers are limited. I don't think there's going to be significant change in uh, in who will be delivering those services and uh, who the contractor will be uh, will be working with. But instead of those uh, providers having to uh, negotiate and work with uh, two, four, up to seven different managed care organizations and the county and the state, they would be working with one entity and being able to process their claims and uh, and arrange for rides uh, through that one entity. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, uh, Representative Keel. Thank you, um, um, Chair Hewitt. Uh, I guess I'm having a hard time with, if this wasn't uh, successful before, why we're going back to it. And also, um, I, I just learned that 20 years ago, uh, 40 years ago, they were see, seeing uh, about $22 um, a ride um, there, I, there's some more detail in there. And now they're receiving 18. So they've gone backwards. The NEMTs have gone backwards in being reimbursed. And my, um, my information has said that the insurance companies actually increased the funds just to keep them going um, during COVID so that they were able to actually provide those. And with gas going up, gas has gone up 50 cents, over 50 cents now up here. And um, insurance, um, rate increase for uh, their vehicles that um, it's going to be real hard for them to meet those um, finances. So then my understanding is that you'll be covering all of that so that there is, a, um, I, I don't, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding how this is working. So maybe it's just me, but um, very concerned that we could lose these um, uh, services altogether. And um, I know we have a lot of volunteer transportation, but we do not have adequate for um, the miles that need to be taken. Um, so I, I don't know if you can assure me that they will, the businesses that exist now will actually be able to be funded appropriately. Can you? Representative Keel, uh, Mr. Anderson, can you answer? Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Keel. I certainly can't speculate about any given business and its uh, financial sustainability. Uh, we know that there have been challenges, certainly during COVID. Um, we have uh, worked with our managed care organizations and encouraged them to use the flexibility they have available to uh, adjust rates uh, to providers to recognize for 
uh, potential lost revenues or increased costs uh, because of COVID. Um, we also have, uh, and we take very seriously our obligation as, as stewards of public resources. And when we have audit findings that show significant rates of uh, um, uh, non-compliance with the requirements for being able to be reimbursed, uh, we need to find ways to be able to address that. And uh, uh, this is one of the ways that we think um, uh, we have a better chance of being able to get uh, better compliance. The other thing I would note is that there are regions of the state today uh, where counties have, are using their own administrator uh, in managing this program and, and uh, doing so successfully. There are all kinds of different um, uh, variations around the country of different ways. This is, this is a difficult benefit to manage and there continues to be experimentation around what are the best ways uh, to be able to do this. Uh, it, it, situations in the past that have uh, that have occurred uh, have you know swung the pendulum in, in different directions as we try to respond and make sure that we're meeting the needs of our enrollees in the best way possible. And uh, um, this is a, a situation where we've had um, changes in in uh, in uh, how we have how we have administered it, and we continue to see uh, compliance issues. And so as we are and as the Blue Ribbon Commission that, that examined this strategy, we're looking at ways to reduce spending, uh, increase uh, compliance, and make sure that our enrollees are able to have access to the services that we need. We think this is a proposal that uh, uh, can help us achieve those goals. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. I'm gonna move forward to Representative Grunhagen at this point. Oh, thank you, Chair Hulick. Yeah, my, uh, Representative Keel asked some of the questions I had too, especially in the rural area. And, you know, if it's been tried before, uh, according to what Representative Keel asked, what were the results then and why are we going back to it now? And then I have another question. Mr. Anderson? Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Grunhagen, I, I don't know. I haven't uh, been at DHS long enough to know exactly what the results were in, in the past. There have been uh, different uh, situations where the state has uh, moved to a single broker uh, kind of arrangement. Uh, the idea in this, in this situation would be to uh, hold that contract uh, closer uh, for the state uh, and also to be able to consider using regional uh, contracts as opposed to a statewide contract, but those would be details that we'd uh, work out after legislation was passed. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, one more question, Representative Grunhagen. Yeah, thank you, Chair Hewitt. Yeah, I mean, if 75% of the rides are not comply with state and federal requirements, if I remember right, there were also uh, some TV investigative on this and uh, do you know how much savings there would be or projected by going to this model? Uh, and also, could those savings be applied to increasing some of the reimbursement rates in the rural area where they're just barely scraping by? Mr. Uh, Mr. Anderson? Yep. Mr. Chair, Representative Grunhagen, uh, you're correct. We will, we will, um, uh, as this proposal uh, moves forward, we will do a, a fiscal note to to get a, a more accurate picture of the projected savings. When the Blue Ribbon Commission looked at this proposal, it's uh, one. It was not doing fiscal notes, but had you know sort of a rough fiscal estimate, and that was before COVID. We know that COVID has changed the landscape significantly, and so we'd like the opportunity to be able to do a a more current uh, uh, fiscal note before we um, uh, before we pin a specific number on it, uh, but absolutely the legislature would have the ability if there are uh, savings that are generated uh, to reinvest those savings in provider rates if it uh, if it chose to do that. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Yep. Representative Grunhagen, I'm going to move on. I, I'm worried about our schedule here, and I don't want to fail my chair. Um, Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and maybe the. Uh, assistant uh, Commissioner could review the OLA report or audit on this topic uh, uh, if he needs background on some of the issues that we have seen and come across in the past. Um, I'd like a little bit of clarification because my understanding over the last uh, five, six years, the total number of entities, and these would be small independent entities across the state that have been put on to uh, 
the list of, you know, we're not going to use them because they had a, a, a what's it's excluded group providers list. Uh, there are 20 in the last, uh, what, six years, um, which is in the single digit percent of providers. Uh, so what is the major driver that you're seeing or say you're seeing uh, issues and fraud to do this major change? And then back on your comment about, well, some counties are directly coordinating, at least in those counties, they know the cities, the, the highways and, and the people more directly than a regional or statewide would. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Chair, Representative Kwan, the uh, issues that we are seeing in terms of compliance uh, remain largely what we saw in the uh, Federal Office of Inspector General report uh, from 2017. Lack of documentation, uh, lack of uh, compliance with rules, including uh, drivers who do not have a driver's license, uh, those kinds of uh, issues are not identifying which vehicle was used uh, for the ride, not having a medical appointment tied to the ride, um, and those kinds of uh, um, uh, issues. And uh, we have a, a current audit that's that's underway. We can't, uh, uh, we're still reviewing the results of that and still working with providers to make sure that we have uh, correct uh, uh, information about that, but it's mostly around uh, the um, uh, issues around uh, documentation and uh, sufficiency of following the rules. They're not necessarily uh, allegations of fraud or convictions of fraud such that a provider would be put it on the excluded list, um, but uh, it does uh, reflect whether or not uh, payments were actually owed under the, under the terms of our, of our programs. Representative Quam, a quick follow-up. Uh, yes. Um, so my understanding is that we're looking at repeating, you know, going back outside again, because the department and agencies are not capable of maintaining guidance to the federal uh, requirements on this program. Um, and if you're if you aren't capable of doing that to this small section of program. Uh, how can we be sure that you're any more capable on all the other programs that are funded through the federal government that require uh, due diligence? In other words, it's not making me feel comfortable. You're saying we can't do it. We're going to have to find someone else uh, when this is such a small part of your pie for uh, other programs. So maybe uh, the committee could get some details on these type of issues in other programs that the agency and departments are are overseeing. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you, Representative Kwam. And I know this will not be the last time we visit this subject. I know this space all too well, and uh, we're, I'm sure we're gonna look into it more. Representative Breyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Grunhagen asked my question virtually word for word, so well done, sir, uh, about would the savings then be used to improve rates? Because to me, that's one of our uh, root cause issues in many areas of healthcare is that some of these um, services that we need so badly don't get enough uh, compensation to keep the lights on. Um, I also wanted to make an observation that I often hear in, not in this, just this committee, but here and elsewhere, We've tried that, it didn't work, why would we try it again? And I would argue that in my career in process improvement and project management, if we didn't keep trying and innovating, uh, we would be permanently stuck um, in a place where we aren't growing, we aren't finding better ways. The real uh, problem is if you just keep trying and doing things the same, thing, same way over and over again, which I don't hear suggested here. So I'm just putting in a voice for innovation and um, thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Ryer. Representative Pryor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess I, I did wanna go back and understand better what we're talking about when we're I'm talking about the audit reports that um, things were not properly documented. And so who, um, you know, where was, where was that issue coming up? Because um, as you know, it's the um, 
the counties or the different, the fee for service, um, um, you know, where, where was it happening that um, there was not the documentation that was required um, by the federal government um, for these, for this transportation. Um, and if uh, um, Commissioner Anderson could address that again one more time and, and just kind of highlight um, where that breakdown was. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Pryor. And Mr. Anderson, we're right on schedule here. Please keep me on time. Can you do it quickly? <laughs> I will do my best, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, uh, uh, all of our providers across our services are required to document the services that they deliver and uh, meet those uh, uh, documentation requirements in order to be able to be reimbursed. So in non-emergency medical transportation, this is really the uh, providers that are delivering the rides uh, that have uh, requirements in state law as to what they have to document and to be able to demonstrate that they are actually delivering the ride, that they're doing it safely, that the uh, patient is getting to the uh, appropriate location uh, and to be able to have uh, the oversight that we need to have in that. One of the challenges, because it is a small program and because it's been fractured into oversight by managed care, by counties, by the state, it becomes very difficult to, uh, uh, in, in sort of in real time, uh, to be able to uh, oversight uh, of those, which is why we have the audits that we do and that we go and, and do spot checks and, and survey to make sure that the documentation uh, is being done. Uh, when we get into situations like this where uh, repeated audits show a large degree, large percentage of uh, failure to comply with those requirements, that's when uh, we have situations where we feel like we can't just turn a blind eye. We have to be able to do something to make sure that we are uh, overseeing the program the way that we need to. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, Representative Pryor. Yep, and so just, so then my understanding then is you have the providers um, and then there's this layer between you and the providers and the breakdown is you have, a, you have, you're trying to do the oversight, but there's a layer between you and the providers and you know that there is an issue um, and to get the proper within that layer so that you're not getting the proper data is what I understood. So thank you. Thank you for that further explanation. So hearing that, I'd like to thank our two testifiers today and we are moving on to our next bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson, for your time today. Our thank next you. bill is House File. 1260, uh, yes, 1268. This is Representative Richardson's bill. I would like to move that this bill be laid over for possible inclusion in our finance bill. Representative Richardson, are you with us? Yes, I'm here, Chair. Nice to see you. Representative Richardson, will you please uh, present your bill? Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Hewitt. Uh, House File 1268 is focused on supporting healthy prenatal developments and healthy development of infants. In Minnesota, we know that we continue to have persistent and unacceptable health disparities in infant mortality and morbidity. We have heard the heartbreaking statistics that in this state, Black and Indigenous infants are more than twice as likely to die than white infants before their first birthday. Despite the long-standing racial disparities in infant mortality and morbidity, public attention has only been recently focused on this issue as a public health crisis. This bill would provide a one-time appropriation to the African American Babies Coalition to implement a community-based and led initiative to implement training, education, and best practices for healthy prenatal and postnatal development, particularly for communities with the greatest infant mortality and morbidity disparities. Today, I have with me uh, Samira Bilal Roby with the African American Babies Coalition, Nidra Robinson with Simpson Housing as a testifiers, and Dominique McQuarrie with Wilder is also available for questions. Thank you, Representative Richardson. Is Ms. Robinson available? Yes, I'm here. Ms. Robinson, uh, welcome to the committee. You're first on my list, so I would love to hear your testimony. Hello, well, my name is Nidra Robinson, and I'm the Early Childhood Program Manager for Simpson Housing Services, and also a funding, a founding a member and trainer for the African American Babies Coalition. So I've seen work since its inception. It's well known that trauma, stress, and systemic racism have adverse effects on mothers and children, especially our African American and Native American women. But we also know that when people know better, they do better. And that's often the mantra that you will hear within the African American Babies Coalition. The work of the coalition is important because it comes from a grassroots effort 
of African-American women to support, mentor, and coach other African-American women about maternal health, parenting practice, practices, and overall child health. We train within our community for our community. Because of my work with the Simpson Housing um, Services, I see on a daily basis what poverty and inequities in healthcare does to young Black mothers. Education through culturally relevant training with nurturing and compassionate trainers is one of our best defenses. A quick example of the powerful work of the African American Baby Coalition is the collaboration between the coalition and Simpson Housing. We held a Mother's Day of Healing for our mothers in our supportive housing program. This was a special all day retreat for these parents that included speakers highlighting the importance of prenatal and maternal health and building resilience. Small group sessions encouraged creativity and healing. Through our community based trainings, African American mothers learn about supporting babies' brain development, strategies that they will use to overcome stress and improve their health and how to self-advocate in the healthcare process. It's exciting for me as a trainer and as I've done trainings to actually see through our discussions that young black parents are learning the importance of high quality and consistent prenatal and maternal care. I strongly support House File 1268. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. And I'm, I'm new at this, so I'm gonna ask you um, to say your full name and your title for the record. Okay, thank you. Nidra, N-E-D-R-A, Robinson, R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N, and I'm the Early Childhood Program Manager for Simpson Housing Services. Thank you, Mrs. Robinson. And Representative Ruth, uh, Richardson, you have one more testifier, I see. That is correct. And may I call, uh, oh boy, this Chair, name's gonna be a Chair, uh, Samir Bilal Roby. Thank you, Representative Richardson. Are you available? I certainly am. And I'm going to do this right this time. Can you say your record? Uh, can you say your name and uh, your title for the record? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Samir Bilal Roby. I am um, the director of Wilder African American Babies Coalition and Projects. Thank you, and you can continue with your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name again is Samira Blau Roby. I'm the director of the Wilder African American Babies Coalition and Projects and program manager for the Integrated Care High Risk Pregnancy Initiative. I'm also, on a personal note, a grandmother of 19. Wilder A B excuse me, Water AABC works to meet the needs of all our families, our interests, and my passion presented today is the continuation of our work with focused on teens, prenatal health, and training healthcare workers. Through our programming, we address adverse childhood experiences by training the workforce in culturally relevant care through evidence-based training designed from experts in, health, in the healthy development. This creates new pathways of health for the entire family. Our concentration, especially right now, is on the human factors related to health and personal interactions with emerging health issues and stress related to COVID-19. My focal point today is on the Black and Indigenous and communities of color with an evidence-based fact. The stress of poverty has the profound indication of disrupted brain development in infants and mental inhibition or inhibish, inhibish, I'm sorry, saying it wrong, in adults who are worrying about their finances and the lack of spending crucial time with their families. There lies the problem of social determinants of health, unsafe environments for teens, women, and babies. Fathers living with depression, worrying about their families, often leading to mental health disturbances for all of the above. In passing Bill 1268, we will be able to expand and deepen our work at AABC. We believe we can benefit as a community by paving the way for all families by acknowledging their circumstances and letting them know they're not alone. This allows us to recognize some triggers, 
which bring out inappropriate behaviors, letting them overcome barriers and learn the everyday essentials of care for a vibrant social life. In closing, I call on you to help pass this bill so that, so that our women, babies, and parents can flourish, providing the attention needed to build healthy human beings. Thank you. Thank you, um, um, Director. And I wanna thank both the testifiers today. This is such an important uh, subject and uh, it's, it's great to see that they have such strong advocates as both of you too. Um, are there any questions from committee members? Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Richardson, for uh, bringing this bill forward. I appreciate um, Ms. Robinson and Ms. Bilal Roby, your testimony. Um, given that we have uh, really a crisis of maternal and infant mortality in Minnesota, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see this bill go forward. I'm sorry it's a one-time appropriation, but I think that reflects the urgency of our need to address this issue. Um, so I'm grateful for the ideas and I'm, and I'm grateful for the bill and I, I urge support um, from everyone on the committee. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Morrison. Are there any other questions from committee members? As not seeing any, it looks like as the chair, I'll renew my motion that 1268 be uh, put uh, for possibility inclusion on the uh, finance bill. Thank you, Representative Richardson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. So it looks like committee, we have another presentation and we're ahead of schedule. Tina's gonna be happy. I mean, she's gonna be proud of me. <laughs> so, um, our presenters now, um, let's see what we're at here. Looks like our presented uh, from, the, from DHS, a report on telemedicine. Um, we have uh, two presenters this afternoon. It looks like uh, starting with uh, Deputy Assistant Commissioner Julie Marcourt. Are you here? Yep, Mr. Chair, I am. Well, thank you, Mrs. Marcourt. You can go ahead with your testimony if you will. Okay. I'll wait till the slides come up here. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, we, uh, Nirja Singh and I, who, who's going to come in uh, partway through here to, to finish up. Um, as everybody knows, uh, we, uh, we ended up in an unprecedented situation um, where we had to create rapid response to an emerging and uncertain pandemic. So uh, we're all familiar with the fact that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services allowed states to submit waivers um, to respond to the peacetime emergency. And so uh, DHS took several steps uh, to ensure that enrollees on our um, medical assistance and Minnesota care programs could continue to receive necessary care and allowing that care to accommodate the stay at home orders and the social distancing requirements that we now found ourselves um, facing. And so in order to do that, we took a series of steps uh, to submit waivers to CMS and to amend our um, basic health program blueprint. So the amendments and the waivers are for the Medicaid program. The basic health program blueprint is what authorizes our Minnesota care program. And some of those were to temporarily expand what we allowed to be covered and paid for enrollees for related to telehealth services. And so um, within the agency, we worked really closely uh, between the, our healthcare administration and our behavioral health division to really try to keep our um, keep alignment as best we could so that providers were getting consistent messages, we were creating consistent requirements, particularly our larger health systems that probably go across the spectrum would have some consistency in the expectations around what they could do, the standards around that, and the way that those services were built. Um, so we were really looking at the immediate needs, um, recognizing that people were going into stay at home orders. We had uh, elective services were suspended for a time period. Um, but how did we, how could we make sure that emergency health care services, primary health care services, specialty health care, 
and treatment services for opiate use disorder, substance use disorder, and uh, mental health services would continue for people who needed them, um, particularly during the initial phases. Um, next slide, please. Um, so within that, there's, there's some vernacular that probably needs a little bit of clarification. So for background, um, there's sometimes you will hear uh, things referred to as telehealth, and sometimes you'll hear a term telemedicine. Telehealth is a broader uh, set of services and techniques that one can use. So it's, the, it's use of electronic information and telecommunications to support clinical um, health care, but it also includes administrative services, uh, some services that are not clinical treatment services. Um, so it includes uh, some of the same uh, technologies support telehealth, but it's a broader set of services that might be provided. Telemedicine is a subset of telehealth, which is really specifically referring to uh, remote clinical services, uh, primarily including treatment services delivered to people. Um, so just to make sure that people understand when we speak about those terms, what we're referring to. Next slide, please. Um, so as, as our healthcare administration and our behavioral health division were, were making all of these changes, um, we, we decided that we, we uh, really wanted to look at what was happening and what was the impact on people, how were providers responding, just to get a sense of, of what was going on, what was working, and where were things maybe not working. Um, and we started to realize this was an opportunity to understand, at least in this really unprecedented situation, where was telehealth really being used? How was it being used? And how were patients feeling about using that? Um, so we examined, and I, I wanna stress this, our results are very preliminary. There is so much data yet to come in. We only have limited claims data to work with. So these are very early results. Um, but we wanted to share them with the community as quickly as we could because we just want to, we understand that this should be a growing body of information that we continue to build on. So our uh, experience really looked at March where the stay at home orders and the expansions began. And our claims data and our analysis really covers through about June of 2021, although we've gained, there are a few things in our study that, that go beyond that date. Um, we really limited our focus to treatment services within the physical health and behavioral health space. So long-term services and supports and case management services were outside of the scope of the study that we did. Although they expanded as well uh, in telehealth, the study doesn't really um, speak to those particular services. And as I said, we were looking to see what providers and services were, were happening. How were providers ramping up services? Could they? provide their services through uh, telemedicine? And then how did that evolve as the situation on the ground changed? And so we, we applied four different methods. Uh, we did review of what literature may have been out there, particularly literature around what was going on during the pandemic. Um, the second method we used was, uh, we had tons of community partners who were doing the same, wondering the same things we were. Is this working? Is this uh, is this good? Should we be doing this? Should we be doing more of this? Is this not a good thing to continue? So we had many providers and organizations doing their own surveys. So rather than us doing another survey, recognizing that providers were already stretched thin and that patients were just trying to figure out how to get services, we, would, we simply asked, can we look at all of your surveys and compile and consolidate perhaps some of that information and share that back? community. So that, that was the second method. The third, we took our claims from managed care and fee-for-service um, and just looked at what, what we could derive from, from our claims data. And then finally, we did uh, some focus groups with providers to hear directly from them about their experiences and the, their perceptions of the experiences of their patients or information they were gathering through questionnaires from patients that they were serving. Next slide. Um, so method one, which was the uh, review of the literature, um, no surprise here, COVID-19 was a catalyst for telehealth. It, it expanded it rapidly and in ways that probably we had never thought it could, um, which was not a bad thing. 
So, uh, the, you know, the good news is this, this wasn't uh, all negative. Um, it certainly ensured that people, when they uh, couldn't get out to get services or perhaps uh, facilities were wanting to reduce their amount of staff, reduce the risk to their staff, that they could provide services remotely and prevent people from having to come into uh, uh, social, um, socially close situations. Um, so it, it certainly in, in enhanced the ability to get timely access to care. It also created more efficiencies. So patients didn't have to get in the car and drive long distances if the provider was typically uh, far away. Uh, it was efficient for patients to be able to fit appointments perhaps into their day much easier. Um, likewise for providers, providers who, had, who normally would visit multiple sites could remain in one place and simply remotely connect with those sites. So there were certainly efficiencies that, that were gained. Um, within that, though, there, of course, is always uh, concern that, that a one-size-fits-all doesn't work for all. And so there, there are certain populations that, that kept coming to light that we really do need to spend some time making sure that this does work. And in particular, seniors uh, came out uh, consistently, and, and in particularly their familiarity with technology and the comfort level with technology. Um, low income individuals, their ability to have smartphones. Do they have smartphones? Do they, do they have internet access? Um, and so does that uh, get in the way? Uh, rural areas, um, yes, it's good to, to have the distance, but you don't wanna create uh, rural, uh, access in rural areas that relies solely on telemedicine. You still want, there are services that still need to be done in person. And so how do we make sure that we're preserving that access in rural areas for people where that, that is the way the service uh, should be performed. Um, individuals with pre-existing health conditions. Um, are, does this really work or are we missing things? Will there be long-term impacts to people who maybe an in-person visit would have served them better? And then of course, anyone with limited internet access, which rural areas are in particular, but we know that our tribal areas do not have internet access. Uh, we know some uh, areas in, in um, larger communities don't have sufficient internet access. So that's just another consideration. And then just generally this uh, rapid uh, expansion means we need to take some time to figure out what the long-term outcomes are. And, and that patient's health outcome at least hopefully improves. Does it stay the same or, or did this do something detrimental? to long-term outcomes. And those are things we just have to study over time. Um, but then also that all healthcare providers should benefit if their services can be safely and effectively provided. There isn't probably a reason to keep certain providers from, from delivering services this way if their services can be appropriately provided. Next slide. Um, and method two, which was the consolidation of the survey information. So this was coming from our local providers um, within Minnesota. And generally the information was, was really quite consistent with what, what the available literature and information was telling us on a more um, national level. Um, but within some of the things that we heard uh, specifically within Minnesota was that th there's definitely a support for continued use of, of telehealth as an option. Um, for provision of some services. I think there were some that worked really well, some that providers maybe felt uh, would be a little bit, could, people could have been better served or certain populations might be better served still doing it in person. Um, but they did say, you really have to look at the type of service, the frequency and the amount, and how often is that person receiving in-person care so that you're not relying perhaps solely on, on telehealth as the only. The patient's preference, their comfort level, do they feel connected? Do they feel like the, the experience is working for them? And then definitely as we learn more about the long-term impacts, um, we need to inform our, our telemedicine policies in the future with, those, with that information as we learn it. And then finally, um, one of the things that I think everybody kind of uh, in the healthcare world understands is one of the biggest uh, reasons we could expand and that providers could expand, uh, particularly in some sectors, was 
because there was a there's been a relaxation in the enforcement of the privacy and security requirements under um, under HIPAA. So the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which created those standards um, in the early 2000s, they are relaxing enforcement right now on those. And so we're allowing technologies that probably wouldn't meet the standard it, under normal circumstances, they're allowed to use those during the pandemic. And after the pandemic, we're not sure yet what that's, that's enforced by the Office of Civil Rights and what the Office of Civil Rights may or may not do with respect to enforcement or changes to HIPAA, we don't know yet. And so if they go back to the pre-pandemic standard, there are providers who probably are not using compliant uh, technologies. Um, next slide. And um, Ms. Marquardt, oh, if I could just for a moment, and uh, members, first of all, I'm taking back the virtual gavel. Thank you to those who helped in my absence. Um, and I see that uh, Representative Pryor has her hand up. I just, uh, Representative Pryor, did you want to ask a question now or do you want to wait till the end? Oops, sorry, I can wait till the end. All right, very good. And, and I just have a real quick question, Ms. Marquardt. Um, when do you think we would know about the federal, uh, what you were just mentioning about HIPAA and whether the waivers, is this something that we, we don't know when we'll know, or is there some time for that? Madam Chair, I think uh, we don't know. <laughs> it, okay. it's, it's not even something that, because it's not even coming out of CMS, it's, it's enforced by a different um, section. They just kind of announce their, <laughs> their changes and they don't really telegraph a whole lot. At least they didn't when they relaxed these. So uh, I expect, I, I think it's, it's on everybody's mind nationally. So the hope is that you know, maybe there's some changes that could be made, but I don't think we know when or what. Okay, and uh, please continue with your presentation okay. and, uh, and then we'll hold all the questions, sorry to interrupt you, and we'll hold the rest of them until the end, thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the last, uh, the last thing I'm gonna present and then turn it over, over to uh, Nirja is, uh, we just wanted to share with you the, the uh, community partners that were working with us, that we're doing surveys, that we were talking to, and that we, we all had an interest in the space. And I can't thank these partners enough. They, we really have been collaborating with them and they have been giving us invaluable information. And so we really wanna make sure we're sharing that back um, and that we're kind of building this together. So we just wanted to give uh, a shout out to our, our uh, community partners here. And I will turn it over to Nirja. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Marquardt, and um, appreciate this big topic for us this year. And um, Nirja Singh, welcome to the committee, and please go ahead, introduce yourself, and go ahead with your part of the presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Uh, my name is Nirja Singh, uh, and I am the Clinical Behavioral Health Director for Community Support Administration. Uh, so I will be taking on where Julie left. Uh, this is like method third that we used in our study. And as you'll see, members and Madam Chair, there was like a significant increase in utilization of telemedicine. Uh, and when, when we're looking at this data, I just want to kind of give a word of caution that this is simply the providers who were telling us whether they were seeing the client in their office or not in their office. So we really do not know the exact modality of telemedicine they were using, like whether it was audiovisual, whether it was HIPAA compliant, whether it was telephone only. So this is simply that they were not seeing the patient uh, in person and utilizing, utilizing other modalities. Next slide, please. This is again, like this is what we found uh, in our uh, analysis of our claim. And Madam Chair and uh, members, as you'll see, that there was a quite a low utilization of telemedicine modalities among our BIPOC communities. So um, as Julie mentioned, that this is an ongoing process. So we will be looking at possible reasons uh, why our communities of color and our indigenous clients uh, did not utilize telemedicine uh, in the same manner as our white, white clients. Next slide, please. 
these are uh, some of the themes that emerged uh, out of our uh, focus group discussions. And as you'll see, uh, we really could not uh, tell like, the modality the providers were using. However, all providers agreed that they were able to significantly scale up their operations uh, during COVID, which was a great news, so that our enrollees uh, were able to get services uh, during this pandemic. Uh, and as you'll see, like, it really rated, uh, it seems to be ideal for young to middle-aged adults who had some fluency uh, with utilization of technology. Uh, seniors and children, uh, they really face a major, uh, like, lot of obstacles in accessing um, that service. Uh, during our focus group, providers also expressed that it was difficult to engage children in calls for extended period of time, uh, which really interfered with uh, the level of service that children need. However, uh, substantially, uh, our providers were able to uh, see that uh, this telemedicine really helped with their clients' uh, issues with mobility or like uh, sometimes uh, Travel, travel restrictions, so they were able to get the services. Next slide, please. These are some of the recommendations that came from the focus groups we did with providers as well as our analysis of the surveys. So our providers are asking for clear guidance from DHS on billing, payment, patient notes, or any other aspects of care. And as uh, Ms. Margaret pointed out right now, uh, Everything is up in the air because uh, Madam Chair and members, we were hoping when we put these waivers in place that we will, the COVID will be over and we will have like a post competition group to compare and we really don't. So it's an ongoing uh, process and uh, we'll have to just learn as we go along. Um, majority of our providers have asked help to ensure access to high speed internet. Uh, we are working and finding out some resources and how to even uh, address this need. Um, also, like a lot of our requirements uh, still need our patients as well as guardians of our patients as their children uh, for like signatures, like physical signatures. So providers, especially our small providers, really struggled in finding ways to obtain electronic signatures. We were able to waive, uh, or we are looking at waiving some of the requirements for uh, even electronic signatures and documenting if verbal consent can work, but that is like, it requires a lot of interface with the federal laws. Uh, and again, providers are asking us to work with CMS, which we are, to find out what would be an easy HIPAA compliance because all our providers really care about patients' confidentiality and patients feeling at ease uh, that when they're talking to their provider, the information is secure. Uh, but they want us to work with CMS and Office of Civil Rights to find out like what would be an easy way uh, to ensure this uh, adherence to HIPAA requirements. And then also uh, there was discussion regarding uh, our clients where English is not the first language and there is need for interpreters, like how this would work for our communities uh, and which is still an ongoing uh, consideration. Next slide, please. Uh, Madam Chair and members, we, we want to make sure we cannot emphasize enough that this is one little step in the direction of uh, ensuring and facilitating access to quality services in Minnesota. We have not, and our Medicaid, uh, National Medicaid uh, Directors is a group, and that group has strongly encouraged all the states to go to our Medicaid enrollees. Like this study has not talked to a single client because we have to go through different procedures to contact our clients. But we really want to, uh, explore and meet with our clients who received uh, telemedicine during COVID to analyze their quality of care experience. What was their experience? Were they satisfied? Uh, this is very much limited to claims data. Uh, and as like kind of, you know what, as I explained in the beginning, we are still in pandemic. So it is so hard to really identify what specific variables telemedicine is going to be impacting on our uh, delivery of our services because COVID has posed unique challenges for our enrollees as, as well as for our providers, loss of jobs. Uh, 
taking care of sick family members, all those issues. So it's really hard to just kind of pinpoint at, uh, okay, you know what, this telemedicine has made a huge difference in lives of people. We don't know that. We had like very limited resources. It was just uh, two administrations coming together because we wanted to continue uh, working on analyzing the impact and ways to increase the efficacy of uh, our services. Um, but as I said, this is the beginning. Uh, we, there is so much unknown in this field. Uh, telemedicine is great, but it does not work for everyone. Uh, and it does not work for every service modality. Uh, I am a practicing clinician and I can just kind of imagine like for some of the services, it would be like, you know what, you are doing the check-in, you are doing a, a clinical symptom check. You could do it over the phone. However, when you are conducting like deep diagnostic assessments, when you're providing therapy for complex trauma issues, which we are really worried that coming out of COVID, people will have a lot of trauma issues. It is really hard to provide that without having visual uh, interaction with the client. In addition, um, the sense of loneliness that our enrollees are reporting. It's really hard for people uh, to be continuing to be uh, getting these services on phone uh, once this pandemic is over. So we would re really want to continue looking at it, uh, understand the efficacy and uh, bringing these resources to our people. Uh, I think that's our last slide. Uh, that's our recommendations for next step, I just covered it. Uh, so we would be uh, conducting additional focus group that is ongoing. Uh, we will be conducting efficacy studies on utilization of telephone only, because that was like a huge uh, way where we were able to get, which really helped people get services during pandemic. So that was great. So we really want to explore that further and see the limitations and what kind of guidance we will need if telephone stays uh, at post pandemic era. Uh, and then most important thing is we want to reach out to our enrollees. We want to reach out to our Medicaid uh, and Minnesota care enrollees to gauge uh, their experience because they are going to be our real uh, judges of the effectiveness of this service. So with that, I'm going to open it up to our questions. All right. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. We really appreciate that. Very, very interesting. Um, Representative Pryor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and yes, thank you for the presentation. And very, um, uh, it's very heartening to know that um, already people are are looking at and making sure that we're capturing the data, um, because we know that this has been something significant. And we certainly identify with this whole idea of telemedicine as we sit here on Zoom, doing <laughs> telecommittees. Um, and there's advantages and disadvantages. So. Um, it's very appropriate to have this discussion, I think, at this point, why we're still in this virtual reality. The question that I, one of the things that came up, and I, I don't think it was, um, you know, maybe it's not appropriate to be looking at it at this point in your data gathering. It was not appropriate, but that um, I, it's going to be a question coming up, which is um, when you find these very appropriate uses for telemedicine, in the future that um, could, you know, being patient-centered is something that works for, for patients. Um, is there a difference in cost? And, that um, would, they, would we um, reimburse at the same rates that we are right now? Or, you know, is there an additional cost as you, as you upgrade what, what's available um, um, through these other channels of, of, of delivering medicine or is it a lower cost? And so I, I don't go in with the idea that, oh, it should be cheaper, um, but that is that something that you're, you think that you'd be able to even access at this point or is there a way of, of, of you know, putting out a plan of, of understanding where we should be going and how that's gonna impact um, the cost of delivering this care? So is that, a, is that from his Marquardt perhaps or? I don't yeah, know who's Chair, more appropriate to answer. Thank you, Ms. Marquardt. I can, I can respond to that. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Pryor, I, 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 that, that's, a, that's a very good question and one we are also asking. Currently, we are paying the same as if the service had occurred in person. Um, and there's you know, lots of good reasons for, for doing that right now, given that right, everybody had to turn on a dime, people had to purchase software, they, you know, uh, 
everybody had to set things up. But I, I, I think mm -hmm. your question is, is really well founded in that over time, once those are in place, as we said, you know, in the review of the literature, there's efficiencies to some of this. So yes, I think there's there's investments. I mean, we talked about investments in broadband and investments in perhaps platforms that can be shared, which would also make it more efficient. Those are really good things that I think we would love to support. Um, but I, I, I do wanna point out too that, um, you know, telephone, which I think Nirja kind of touched on is not telemedicine, right? So someone picking up the phone and doing that is not actually generally considered. We are considering it telemedicine during this pandemic. Um, I think there are lots of questions about whether telephone uh, should actually be reimbursed at the same level as an in-person visit. And I think that's a valid uh, concern that all state Medicaid programs have right now, um, because that, that probably isn't, there are so many things you can't do when you can't visualize someone, let alone touch them. Um, that you really are limited and are you doing the same service then at that time? And we have seen that CMS has created on the physical health side, some specific codes just for tele telephone. And they don't pay as high as if you do the evaluation and management service in person. So we don't know if that trend will continue, if they'll create telemedicine codes. You know, th there's a lot of unknowns. And I do think we will get some information from some providers who we do get their costs. We, we do actually get cost detail information that'll take probably another year and a half to two years before they have those final cost reports, but we will get some information from some providers on, on the actual cost. All right, thank you. Um, Representative Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is around um, HIPAA compliance. That was mentioned a couple of times. And I wonder if you could just briefly maybe um, talk about that a bit of what, um, in what ways is that not being followed or is that, is that specific to the platforms that are used or can, can you just talk a little bit more about what that looks like in practice and, and perhaps what would uh, need to be changed to um, make those practices become compliant? Uh, Ms. Marquardt, is that one for you also? Uh, sure. Yeah, <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, I, it, the, the main aspects that are, that are being not enforced right now are generally around the, um, the security requirements. Um, so is the technology hardened enough that it, it can't be infiltrated? Um, the, there are, we had lots of providers who already had HIPAA compliant systems and they continue to use them. But for providers who maybe didn't use this method, it, it, I, I don't think they could just stand up <laughs> a HIPAA compliant uh, uh, platform. So uh, generally speaking, it's the hardening of the security around it and then the ability to do audit, uh, audit trails. There are requirements in HIPAA that require that you, you maintain the session data, which is just the technology behind the scenes of when did it start, when did it end, who, which IP address were you connecting to and where was that located so that you could actually validate that the service occurred and that it occurred at the place that, that they said they were. Um, those kinds of things are, are what's being relaxed on enforcement. They still apply, it's just violations are not being Okay. Other questions, members? All right, I'm not seeing any. I just have a couple of comments and unfortunately I missed the very beginning, but the fact that these are, are recorded is gonna save me here because I'm gonna go back and watch the entire hearing. But um, a couple things really jump out at me from the presentation and one is the complexity of this whole issue. And some of the really great, the great member questions kind of put a, put a spotlight on that too, that we have to think about, you know, what should, what should be paid for? Um, which things do we want to, obviously when you pay for something, you incentivize it. That's kind of one of those truisms of our work here, right? And so if we're paying, for example, for telephone visits, are we gonna get more telephone visits or, you know, all of the complexities that you talked about, there's just a lot to consider here. So um, I really appreciate that how the 
the report kind of unpacks some of this and helps us think about the different issues involved in it. That's really important. The other thing that really strikes me is sort of the timeline of this. So there are some bills uh, circulating right now that will, you know, may or may not be go through this committee that are about this issue, what we should do with telemedicine, how we should, you know, pay for it. What should we to kind of make permanent some of the things that we've been doing temporarily during COVID. And so one thing that kind of struck me from the presentation is that, uh, and you know, this is just for all of us to think about that perhaps we're not really ready and perhaps we won't be ready for a while to sort of make these decisions on a permanent basis. And um, so, you know, I think that we as legislators, um, we wanna do the best for, our, for our, our constituents, which is the patients who are utilizing these services or could be utilizing them. We wanna make sure that we're doing our duty to the state by making sure that we manage our budget and we don't pay for the wrong things or too much for the wrong things and that we do pay enough for the right things. And, you know, so this is a really heavy responsibility for us. There's a ton of money, as you all know, you've heard all these presentations about how much money we spend on health services. It's a lot. So this is important. We need to get this right. And I guess what I'm, what I'm saying here is I'd really love members to kind of help think about what our strategy should be for this session. And I'm thinking that maybe our strategy ought to be that we do something to extend some things on a temporary basis while we continue to collect some of this data, especially God willing when the COVID emergency is over and things start to get back you know, where people can go in for visits more and see how some of these things play out. So we get some more answers before we put permanent solutions in place. So I'm just putting that on the table for members to really think about because this is one of the more complex and sort of weighty responsibilities that we have this session. And I think members also see that the session, the funnel is sort of really starting here as we get closer to uh, deadlines and we're gonna have to make some very momentous decisions in a very short amount of time. So anyway, Representative Pryor, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, for recognizing me again because I realized I had my turn, but I'm kind of you know very much um, hearing what you're saying and appreciate your comments there. And I wanna add to it, um, Based on the presentation, I think um, what uh, Ms. Marquardt did mention is that it was talking to providers um, and not, you know, they just didn't have the opportunity yet to, to talk to um, the people receiving the care. And so for me, that's that's a huge driver of, of you know, what that's such a such a central part of, of this, this question and this complexity that we have to look forward to because I know, you know, anecdotally, I would say my mother had a had a small stroke and she was visiting with her her the professional, the expert in the field through telemedicine. And that was the best medicine for her to have that conversation and not have to drive to a different city to do it. So I, I guess as we you know move forward and think permanently what should be in place, that we begin with, you know, what was the experience of of, of the people receiving the care and make sure that that's um, definitely part of the conversation going forward. And I, I can see where we, we're not gonna solve all of this before the end of this budget session. I, it's good, good words of wisdom. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you, Representative Pryor. And let me just ask um, Ms. Marquardt and Ms. Singh, if you um, sort of what the plan is for continued study. Um, now, I know you said in the, in the presentation that it's difficult because you, we had all hoped that we were gonna have this, the emergency be over and then there'd be some comparisons that could be made. And obviously that hasn't happened, although we, we hope that we're seeing it happen fairly soon. But is there a formal, a plan for any sort of more uh, formal evaluation or not more, but you know, formal evaluation of some of these issues that we'll be able to, to look to? Is that something that Perhaps uh, we could, the legislature's partnership is needed to be able to provide some, the ability to do that, because this is, there's an awful lot at stake here for patients, for the state, for everybody. 
Mm -hmm. I can take that, uh, Madam Chair, and then Ms. Margaret can add. Uh, well, the next step, uh, we already have provider focus groups going on, asking them regarding utilization of telephone only. As I uh, said in my presentation, like how providers were able to or not able to address complex behavioral health concerns, like I said, complex trauma or severe grief issues using telephone only, because it's it's not possible, we all know that, without seeing the patient that you can treat some of those uh, areas. So we are, uh, those focus groups are going on right now. Um, we are working to submit a request to our research board to develop a plan, because we need to go to our IRB board uh, to con conduct these focus groups with our Medicaid enrollees. So we will be reaching out to Medicaid enrollees too, um, asking about their experience of care with telemedicine, uh, and different modalities of telemedicine, audiovisual as well as use of telephone only. So those are like two broad uh, areas that DHS at this time um, will be going into. And of course we will need, um, as both Julie and I mentioned, like it was just uh, our two divisions coming together and just kind of pulling stuff. So yes, we will need a lot of support and resources to, to do it right. Because again, it's an ongoing process. It's not an end. Uh, as like we have new challenges, we'll continue to uh, explore those. Uh, and I can only speak for behavioral health and Julie can just speak of overall health care, <laughs> like what are the plans there? Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Marquardt. Did you wanna add anything to that? Um, Madam Chair, yes, I just I just had one thing to add. I, you know, in addition to uh, what, what uh, Ms. Singh said, which is, uh, you know, the first we wanna talk to enrollees, that, that's critically important to understand their experience and understand that, you know, <laughs> at, when everything's closed down and I have to stay home, maybe something was better than nothing, but if I have the option, maybe I'd rather, or maybe for some people, this was right up their alley and they love it. And we just, we just need to know. And I think the other thing that we didn't, uh, is in the slides, but we probably didn't highlight well enough was, uh, we really need to talk to providers with, uh, who, who provide culturally competent care that, that we really talk to different uh, racial and ethnic groups that are represented to make sure that all of these modes, uh, number one, work. If they need interpreters, does that work? If, if it doesn't, could it work? And what would that have to look like? Um, but then also ensure that we don't create a two-tiered system either. We don't want to incentivize that low-income folks in Minnesota receive care that looks very different. So we also want to stay in touch with the rest of the healthcare payer community and provider community that everyone has access to the services that work for them. Whether you're high income, low income, we, we don't want to get too far away or too far different from each other. So we also want to stay uh, really connected to, to the broader payer groups um, in Minnesota too. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Marquardt. I'm going to call on Representative Kwan, but I just want to say that um, uh, one of my concerns, one of my many concerns about how we move forward here is that, you know, I don't want to have telemedicine so replace uh, other, having, you know, I guess brick and mortar providers, if that's the right way to say it, um, that say we don't have uh, networks anymore in greater Minnesota. So if there's no, you know, right now it's already, we don't have enough, enough um, mental health professionals especially in greater Minnesota. And I would hate to have it be, oh, well, you can call someone on the phone, so we don't need any there. I, I, that's a bit of a concern that I have that it would act as, as a you know, disincentive for especially for payers to make sure that, you know, that they're doing what they need to do to keep providers actually in more remote areas of the state. Uh, Representative Kwam. Madam Chair, and you and I remember the great Karnak, and in your mind, I'm reading um, augment. So the telemedicine should augment uh, the accessibility. I see the community paramedic was a form in which we augmented the normal healthcare providing, and we we assisted outside of you know the major cities. Um, we earlier discussed non-emergency medical transport. And a lot of that uh, involves possibly things we could look at uh, 
doing some telemedicine. Uh, Minnesota is a net, uh, um, the best way to put it, there are pa more patients that live outside Minnesota that have care inside Minnesota than most states. And because of that, uh, some of our healthcare providers have been ahead of the curve in um, you know, pre-screening or uh, contact away from the main facility. And part of the question is what are the federal uh, things enabling us to do what we need to do for uh, telehealth and the other augmentations we're doing. Um, and at some point after the budget is done, it'd be nice to have some sort of a presentation of the current state of cooperative medical care across the, the country and how that uh, impacts and do we have to have enabling language, you know, and et cetera. Because I think telehealth, like many things have been pushed forward by the pandemic and, you know, we're doing, you know, distance work, et cetera. Um, so I, I'm excited for the possibilities. I, I know that you got to watch where you step. I grew up on a farm and, uh, you know, frankly, uh, we got to be careful, but let's move forward because we've got players in the state that uh, are very anxious to uh, take us to the next steps. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Quam. Representative Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to, to recenter on the possibilities of telehealth. I feel like the conversation's turned a little negative because I do think this is one of the silver linings. Um, if there can possibly a, be a silver lining of the pandemic. We've learned that this is an incredible opportunity to expand patient access to, chair, to care. Um, it expands patient choice. It saves patients money. I see it as a very patient-centric um, uh, improvement in many cases. So we have to do it right, and I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation, but I think there's, there's a lot of positivity and a lot of hope um, about the possibilities of, of real progress that telehealth can bring us. Yeah, thank you, Representative Morrison. No, I agree. I think that's, thank you for that. Um, I think that's, that's been very clear. And, um, you know, there are things that we need to work on to make sure that it, that we do it right. But, but absolutely, I don't think anyone's talking about, let's go back to where we were. I think that the real question is, how can we best go forward? So, um, anyway, other questions, members, or comments? We have three minutes. All right, not seeing anybody. So thank you all very much. Uh, we appreciate the presentations. Uh, thank you very much for that work. And um, so, members, I just uh, want to let you know, here's, here's um, talk about bad news. We're adding a hearing this week on Friday from 3 to 4.30, and we're, we're going to be doing additional hearings on Fridays 3 to 4.30. So block that out on your calendar. Uh, we're getting to that time of year, and uh, you know we just have to make sure that we get through the things we need to before deadlines. So um, the next meeting is tomorrow. We're going to be hearing a bill from Representative Ryer and a bill from so we're going to be hearing House File 363. We're going to be hearing House File 1000 from Representative Schultz and then House File 1139, which is mine. So with that, members, thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow. With that, we are adjourned.